Thank you so much, Barry. It's really exciting to be here. Praise the Lord. I'm excited because uh, the Lord is equipping his people. He's doing something strategic in our time. He's bringing the nations that we have worked so hard for hundreds of years to reach with the gospel. He's bringing those nations that we have trained missionaries to go to and suffer to reach. Um, and he's, he's, he's taken those nations from all around the world and he's bringing them right to our neighborhoods. And I just think that's an amazing strategic time. And I feel so privileged to be here. I really enjoyed last week. Did you enjoy last week? Good, I did too. You're the best uh, crowd I've ever trained before. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, well. The, during our, the first talk last week, we covered uh, the why, why we are concerned about this, why we should know how to reach Muslims for Christ and care about it, and we covered the what. What is Islam? We had this overview of Islam, and really, uh, after going through that, you know more than many millions of Muslims know about their own religion. They're, they're not an informed group. Uh, they're, they're not given a lot of information, or they may not understand it because it may be given to them in a language that isn't their original language. The, the language of, of Islam is Arabic. And today we're gonna cover the how. How do we reach them for Christ? But before we do, I wanna give you a little quiz. You ready? Be more enthusiastic, please. And uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a prize. This is a, a book written by someone who's actually on our staff. He's, he's a missionary in Spain and he's part-time working for the International Muslim Outreach, our organization. And he's written this book called Sharing Jesus with Muslims in America. And this can be yours if you answer the questions to the following quiz properly. So um, I'd like a volunteer. All right, so I'll tell you what the question is. And then you can raise your hand if you think you can do it. And it's okay if you get a little help from the crowd. Okay, here's the question. What are the five pillars of Islam? The five good deeds that Muslims believe you need to do in order to get to heaven. They've distilled the Hadith and the Quran down to five good deeds. What are those five good deeds? All right, we have a taker over here. Please stand. No, that would be great. And people can help you too. Okay. So, good. So what are the five good deeds? Um, the Islamic Creed. Okay. And what is that? The call to prayer. Right. And how does it go? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, prayer. Right. And how many times a day? Good. Five. Good for you. Fasting. Yes. Good. Would you give her a hand? Come on up and get your book. Thanks. What's your name? Lindsay. Lindsay. Well done, Lindsay. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Good. You all were listening. Excellent. All right. So today we're going to cover the, the how. And the first thing you need to, do, to know when you are reaching Muslims for Christ is that they are prepared for you. They have been trained since they were little to uh, question Christians on their theology. And the questions aren't just simple questions, they're really tough questions. They go right to the heart of the most difficult theological questions in Christianity, and they'll do it right over tea uh, the first time you talk to them. So let's go over those, and we're gonna practice them a bit. The first challenge you'll get is that Jesus cannot be God. They'll say, how can you say that God, the one who created the universe, could possibly take on flesh and become a human being? How's that possible? And how do you answer that? Well, I think an effective answer is to say, what is God capable of? And they will, they'll say, everything. And then you say, well, then he is capable of taking on flesh and walking on the face of the earth. Another thing you can point out is that we believe in a God who can multitask. Muslims believe that God is strictly one. And so their point is, God can't 
sustain the universe and be a human at the same time. And you can tell them, we believe in a God who is so powerful that he can multitask. He can sustain the universe and walk on the face of the earth in human flesh at the same time. He can also indwell believers in the Holy Spirit and sustain the universe at the same time. You guys are being very quiet as you ponder this. Good, well let's practice this. Please turn to someone next to you. One of you is the Muslim, one of you is the Christian. The Muslim, challenge the other person and say Jesus, uh, that God cannot become a human being and then give them a good answer. Go, go, let's go for it, take two minutes. All right, turn around and reverse. The Muslim is now the Christian. The Christian is now the Muslim. Challenge him. God cannot be a human being. All right, very good. Okay, so let's go to the next one. The next challenge. They're going to challenge you on the Trinity. How many of you here can explain the Trinity really easily and well? It is a tough doctrine. And Muslims will force you to think about it. Sir? Water. You like, you like to use the three phases of water, the liquid, gas, and solid. Yeah, that's one way to do it. If you can find an analogy that you're comfortable with to use for the Trinity, that's wonderful. Most analogies, if you push them too far, end up not describing the Trinity very well. They end up in heresy, but analogies do help. And there's analogy, an analogy I like to use, and it is this. I'll ask my Muslim friend when they challenge me on the Trinity, you guys believe in three gods, they'll say, or how can you believe that God is three and then claim that you worship one God? I'll ask them, do you have a body? They'll say, yes. Do you have a spirit? They'll say, yes. Do you have a soul? They'll say, yes. I ask them, are you three human beings? And they get the point. Uh, a being can be uh, other than a simple unity. There can actually be a being who is three. That's the human being. And maybe we're little pictures of how God is. So that made a lot of sense to the Muslims that I've talked to, and that'll work well for you. Another thing you can point out over tea, of course, as you're having this wonderful friendship with your Muslim friend, is that the Muslim God, the God of the Quran, is alone until he creates other beings. And because of that, he does not have anyone to love. Until God, the God of, of Muhammad creates someone to love, there's no one to love. And so it's difficult to say that love is part of who he is in his being. Does that make sense? Kind of? Sort of? Okay, you could just say, no, Matt, that doesn't make any sense at all. What's wonderful and amazing about the fact that our God is a trinity, that he is three persons in one being, is that for all of eternity... The three persons of the Trinity have been loving one another with perfect love. We worship a God who is not only love, but he is community of love. And because of that, love is part of who he is, and he invites us into that amazing love of who he is. And this is a fundamental reason that Muslims do not know God as loving it's partly due to the fact that they have this view of God as a monolithic entity all alone who creates for who knows what purpose and randomly throws people in heaven or in hell at the, at the day of judgment. 
But we know a God whose being is love and who so loved the world that he decided to give of himself. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So our doctrine of the Trinity reveals something amazing about God. And that's something you can share with your, your Muslim friend with enthusiasm. So let's practice this one. Get with your partner and one of you is the Muslim and you say, what, you believe in three gods, some kind of trinity? How does that work? Challenge him, make him pay. And then the Christian, answer the question using the, the slide. Go ahead, let's do it for about two minutes. If you're alone, please find a partner. All right, let's switch the role play and the Muslim now become the Christian and the Christian become the Muslim and practice again. You know, if you practice now, you never know when this can actually happen in real life. So prepare like it's gonna happen to you. All right, let's go on to the next objection. The third objection we've already heard from about last time, and that is they'll complain, your Bible is corrupted. They'll say, look at all the different versions that you all read, and uh, which one of those is the word of God. We Muslims have only one scripture, and it's the same all over the world. And as we discussed last time, that's not actually true. They do have different versions, but that information is suppressed really carefully all around the world. Muslims believe that all of their Qurans are identical and that that's proof that it's the word of God. They believe that our Bibles are all different, and that that's proof that that's not the word of God. And so what we can say to them is this, you Muslims think that the word of God is the letters, but we Christians know that the word of God is the meaning. And because it's the meaning, we can translate that meaning into any language in the world. And because it's the meaning, we can work on on our translations and improve them and make them reflect modern language as it changes all the time. And that's why we have different versions. And then the, uh, the other challenge at this point that I like to give Muslims, and I don't like to attack Islam at all when I'm talking to Muslims. It usually is not very productive. Uh, they're very sensitive about that. And we'll talk more about how they come from honor-shame cultures today. But I, I will, when this challenge is made, challenge them on this fact. You Muslims have no religious information except what came through the mouth of one man, Muhammad. And you're you're gambling your whole life, your family, your nations, you and 1.9 billion other people around the world are gambling your eternal future on the word of that one man. And that bothers me. And then I ask them, what if someone came into this room right now and said, hey, guys, the angel Gabriel appeared to me last night and gave me a new scripture uh, to recite, and it's going to replace the Quran and the Bible. Would you believe them? They'll understand what point you're making. You need a reason before you accept someone who says, I am a prophet. So uh, this is a challenge that I will gently give a Muslim who is who is telling me that our scriptures are corrupted in answer, but it's one of the very few challenges I will give when I'm talking to Muslim people. So this is the last time we'll practice this. These are the three main objections. It's Jesus can't be God, and uh, your scriptures are corrupted, and the Trinity doesn't make sense. So let's practice this one also. Find someone, please, if you're alone, practice telling them 
why you can uh, trust the Christian view of the scriptures. Go ahead, let's practice for two minutes. All right, switch now to the other. The Christian is now the Muslim, and the Muslim is the Christian. Good. Thank you for practicing that. Practice makes perfect. It just helps us to internalize it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, I've had this conversation many times. I remember one time I was talking about the Bible with an Egyptian young man at a picnic we were having in Tampa. And he was challenging me on the Bible. And I, I told him, I said, you, you Muslims think that the, the word of God is the letters, but we Christians know that it's the, the meaning. And, and I said, and I challenged him, why, why did you, have you put all your trust in one man? Uh, there are no witnesses that he saw an angel uh, and, and no witnesses that he took a special animal and went to Jerusalem and went up to heaven. All the traditions that they have about Muhammad, no witnesses at all. It was all on Muhammad's word. And he looked at me and he said, I wish that someone could die and come back from the dead and tell us the truth. And I thought, wow, <laughs> what an opener. <laughs> so I joyfully explained to him, yes, well, actually, that has actually happened. Someone died and came back and told us the truth. So he ended up agreeing to go to study the Bible with some Christians. So, Okay, those are theological, what I call theological tripwires. Next, let's cover some cultural and political tripwires, some cultural tripwires. All right, I'm gonna ask you a question. As you're looking for a, this is an election year, right? Aren't you happy? <laughs> Such a bright time in our history. <laughs> uh, so uh, during election year, what are you looking for in a leader when you vote? Uh, why don't you think of one word, uh, that what are you looking for? Raise your hand and give me a word here. So, anybody, sir? Sanity. Sanity. You want to. <laughs> okay, commentary here. Over here, yes, sir. I like it. Serve the people, not themselves. Yes, ma'am. Integrity. Yes, sir. Honesty. Okay, whenever I ask that question all around America and churches, in the first three answers, every time the word integrity or honesty comes up. And that's because one of our cultural core values is integrity. We really care about truth. We really care if we can trust someone's word. It's part of who we are as a culture. Now, if I were to go to Jordan, where I spent years as a missionary, and ask that same question, integrity wouldn't come up. The answers would be more something like this. I want a leader who preserves the honor of myself, my family, and my tribe. Where integrity is a core value in our culture, honor is a core value in many of the cultures that Muslims come from. How other people perceive you and how they honor you is so important to these cultures. So why does that matter? That matters because, you know, because we emphasize integrity so much, sometimes when we're discussing something with somebody and we catch them in an inconsistency or a contradiction, we'll pounce on them. Ha! Look, see? You got that wrong. Ha! We'll make a big deal out of it, right? Or if somebody cuts line in the supermarket, 
We'll get angry with them in the supermarket. We just really, we get upset about violations to integrity. With our Muslim friend, it's good to have a different feeling, to be gentle and a little bit more tolerant of violations of our integrity uh, view um, in order to honor them. I remember I was going through Jordan, uh, driving along, and um, we were going south toward Aqaba in the desert. And over a little hill, we saw some baby camels. There's nothing cuter than a baby camel. It's really cute. So we got out and took some pictures of the baby camels. And right away, the, there was a gentleman and his son, who are obviously the camel herders. He came marching toward us with a stick in his hand, shouting at us, why are you taking pictures of my camels? I, told, I said to Maeve, get in the car, get the kids in the car, lock the doors. This gentleman and his son came right up to me with their sticks, shaking their sticks at me. Why are you taking pictures of my camels? So I looked at him and I said, uh, is this, he's a Bedouin. The word Bedouin is referred to the Arabs of the desert. I said, is this Bedouin hospitality? And I'll never forget it. He looked at me, he straightened up, and he said, will you come to my tent for tea? Just like that. And what I had done was tripped on their honor code system and reminded him of his honor code. So important to him, it instantly brought about a change. We did not go to his house for tea. So integrity and versus honor. It's nice to remember with your Muslim friends, they really care about honor. Show them respect and gentleness. And doesn't the, don't the scriptures kind of tell us to do that? Always be prepared to make an answer for, to, for the hope that you have within you, but yet do it with what? Gentleness and respect, right? Also, the Bible tells us to speak the truth with what? Love. There's kind of a balance between honor and truth. You don't compromise truth but you add honor to it. All right, another thing you'll see, a core difference in the cultures of Muslims and Christians is systems versus people. In the West, we love systems. We love our schedules. We love machines. We love anything. We love traffic laws. But just go to the Middle East and you'll see a very different approach to life. Uh, the traffic, for one thing, you know, just very different. Anyone driven in the Middle East before? Yes. Different, isn't it? They might as well not paint lines on the road. Yes, the lines are suggestions. Those are guidelines, not real lines. <laughs> right. It's a, it's, but, you know, you learn how to do it. It's kind of a thing. You use your horn a lot. So, the very different approach. Very different approach. What this means is, we need to remember this when we're relating to our Muslim friend. They put people way above schedules and systems. So let's say, for example, that I'm uh, driving to work and I see my Muslim neighbor. I'm late for work. Okay, so I'm in the car and I'm in a hurry. And my Muslim neighbor sees me and waves to me. The American thing to do is wave and go, right? Get to work on time. I would ask you to reconsider and maybe play the game their way. Stop, roll down your window and act like the best thing that happened to you all day is seeing your Muslim neighbor. Man, I am glad to see you. I'm late for work, but I'm glad to see you. Just like that. That's kind of to put people first before our systems. We're very system oriented. Um, and they, they show that in their hospitality as well. Uh, you know, you, for example, in, in Jordan, uh, we went to a lot of weddings and it took us a few times to notice that when they said nine o'clock and we showed up at nine o'clock for the wedding, we were the only people there for at least an hour. And we kind of figured out that when they announced the starting time for a wedding, it's not when the wedding takes place. That's actually when you remember, oh, there's a wedding and we need to start getting ready and going. It's kind of when you start getting ready. So we figured that out after a while. The third cultural tripwire, the difference between many Muslim cultures and our culture is individuals versus groups. In our culture, we emphasize individuals, right? 
you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, but have you ever tried that? It's actually a violation of the laws of physics. Uh, you can't do it. In their culture, they would never demand that an individual pull themselves up by their bootstraps. In fact, they're, they are dependent on each other in their families, financially and relationally. They're very, very group-oriented. And so it's good to remember that because in our culture, we expect individuals to be brave and to make their own decision to accept Christ. But your Muslim friend might be a lot more concerned with the, their family and what the people around them think and the impact it will have on their tribe. In fact, that's the biggest obstacle to a Muslim coming to Christ is probably their parents. I often say the real God of Islam is not Allah, it is mom and dad. They don't want to dishonor mom and dad. So it's good to remember that and to have mercy on them and to be patient with them. Okay, besides uh, the theological tripwires and the cultural tripwires, there are also political tripwires. All Muslims all around the world are fixated on politics and very concerned about what is going on in, in Israel with this conflict. All of the Muslims all around the world. And they're also concerned because there are non-Muslim nations involved militarily in the Middle East. That is very, very concerning to Muslims. It's not something they like and they're very sensitive about it. And then Muslims all have this idea that wherever they go in the Western world, they're the victim. They're being persecuted, they're being hated, there's Islamophobia. Have you heard that term, Islamophobia? And they'll, they'll be quick to pull it out. Okay, that's their view. If you have a Muslim friend, they're going to talk politics to you. And they're going to say things that you don't disagree, that you don't agree with and that make you upset. They do it to me all the time. I love my country, I'm very conservative, so forth, and they just try to rope me in all the time. My advice is do not talk politics at all with your Muslim friend. They're gonna say stuff you disagree with, find some way out. Now, if they pin you down and demand an answer from you, here's how you answer. Next slide. This is how you handle a political discussion. Let's say they say this. Isn't it terrible how Israel murdered that, that uh, little boy yesterday and it was in the news? I mean, they might say something like that. Who knows what the backstory is? Who knows if the boy was really murdered and so on and so forth? They're looking for your reaction. Here's how I would answer it. I would say, all of these terrible things that take place all over the world come from the same problem. It's a problem in the human heart. If we could solve the problem in the human heart, we could solve all these problems in the world. Actually, God has provided a solution to that problem. The problem is called sin. The Bible explains to us that all people have sin. And so the problem is with all humanity. But God sent a savior to save us from sin and then you can tell the gospel. So that's how I would handle politics, but otherwise I'd stay away from it. And I, I violate that rule all the time. So, all right, now I want to go on to five steps to reach Muslims for Christ. These are the five factors that we have seen God use again and again to bring Muslims to Christ, the most effective things you can do. If you have a Muslim, how many of you know a Muslim person? Wow, praise the Lord. I'm glad to be talking to you. If you know a Muslim person, apply these five steps and watch God work. The first one is to pray. Very early on in this ministry, I kind of learned about the importance of prayer. This is not a ministry you will do effectively unless you talk to God regularly about it. I was in a library in the first year of uh, founding the International Muslim Outreach. I founded it in 2013. And, and I saw a Muslim woman off in the stacks. She was wearing the hijab. That's the name for the cloth they wear over their heads. And she was doing something with books over in the stacks. I was with my kids seated uh, at the library. And uh, so I had developed this habit. When I see a, Mus a person I know is a Muslim, I'll pray two things for them. I pray, Lord, would you please preach the gospel to that person today? And would you help them to understand it? So I prayed, Lord, 
please preach the gospel to that woman and help her to understand it. She put down her books, wandered over, and sat down next to me. I said, Lord, that's not what I meant. (laughs) But the Lord gave me grace to start a conversation. Now, normally in their cultures, men and women don't interact. But an interesting thing in the United States is Muslim women feel a lot freer to uh, interact if it's a public place, if it's safe, if you're polite, keep distance, and you're smiley, and that kind of thing. You can have a chit-chat with the opposite sex in public. We talked for 45 minutes about the gospel. She asked question after question. At the end of it, I said to her, have you, how long have you been here? She said, 15 years. I said, you've never heard this before? She said, I've never heard this before. I thought, we need to change that. You know, the churches need to change that. Prayer is important for several reasons. Number one, because It is God who changes the heart ultimately. We need to talk to him about it. The Bible says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Second reason, we are in a spiritual battle. We're not fighting people, we're fighting cosmic powers. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If we're fighting unseen forces, we need to pray and ask for God's help. And then in that same passage, he says we should be praying at all times in the spirit. The third reason we should pray is because Christ told us, if you want to bear fruit, you must remain in me. If you don't remain in me, you won't bear any fruit, but if you do, you will bear much fruit. We'll have an impact on other people's lives if we are in Christ. How do we stay in Christ? By talking to him. That's part of it. So prayer is vital. First thing is prayer. Second thing, be a friend. The studies are all showing all Muslims in the West are coming to Christ through contact with a friend. I think that's so exciting because I'm talking to people who have Muslim contacts, you could be that friend that they need. And one of the things you do is show hospitality. Let me give you a few rules about Muslim hospitality. Maeve and I learned this over many years uh, as missionaries in Jordan. And you can read about it actually in the Bible in Genesis chapter 18 when it describes Abraham showing hospitality to three strangers. Uh, and in that story, uh, he sees three strangers coming. You can read about it. And, and uh, he runs out and he says, please stop and, stay and, and eat at my house. And that's the first rule of hospitality in these cultures. Be proactive. They are used to people asking them to their houses all the time. And they're used to dropping in on people all the time. It used to be true in Alabama, didn't it? You sit on the porch, your neighbor walks by, and you'd say, come on in for some food, right? But it's changing. Our culture is losing some of that hospitality. So be proactive and invite them. In fact, it's very normal when you are talking to a Muslim and you're realizing you're enjoying the conversation to invite them to your house in that first conversation. Why don't you, hey, I'm really enjoying this. You gotta come over to our house for dinner. Are you free Friday night? Like that. That is very normal and very, very To them, encouraging. This really means friendship. The second thing is food and drink is key. They love food. We love food too. How many of you love food? Yes, I agree. And uh, and drink. But the key with their hospitality is they'll give it to you without asking if you want it. So they bring it and... and, uh, whether, whether you ask for it or not, on a tray. So that's kind of a little thing to remember. You don't have to do it this way. We're Americans, but it's nice to know that's their attitude in hospitality. Third thing, and this is what Abraham does with the strangers, right? They come to his house. He sits them down in a nice place. He says, Sarah, quick, make three seas of, fla- of, of, you know, take three seas of flour and make bread. And uh, three seas is about four quarts of flour. That makes a lot of bread. Uh, And then he goes and kills the fattened calf and brings it out for them. He prepares amazing food. He never asks them if they want it. He just gives it. 
prepare a nice place. Usually in an Arab home, there'll be one room that's set off, that's kept clean and beautiful, and they'll bring their guests into that room. And, uh, and Abraham, he, it's, it makes a point in that story in Genesis 18, that he puts them in a shady spot next to some trees. He has a, a nice place for them. So it's, it's good to have a room that's kind of neatened up and clean for your, for your uh, Muslim friend to sit in. And then finally, there are some uh, rules about men and women interacting that they observe. In a, a very conservative Muslim situation, men and women don't interact at all. I remember when I first went to Jordan at age 18, I uh, went, was invited to a house for uh, tea, and I walk in, um, and I go into the living room, and um, there's a woman in there, and she, I think she had her hijab off, but I walk in, when I walk in, she screams and runs out of the room, um, and I thought, oh boy, what did I do? Uh, but I learned that's because in their cultures, in the conservative Muslim cultures, a woman cannot be alone with a man in a room. If she is alone with a man in a room, she has brought dishonor on her family and her tribe because they assume that the worst has happened. If she brings dishonor on her family and tribe, remember it's an honor-shame culture, that honor has to be restored. And so it becomes the duty of the man of the family to kill the woman in order to restore the uh, honor of the tribe. It's called an honor killing. So her life is actually, that's why she screamed, her life is in danger. That's not true everywhere. And with your Muslim friend here in the United States, how are they going to manage that kind of expectation? They've changed in the United States, but still, when they visit, it's nice to respect a little bit of distance between the, the husband, uh, not the husband and the wife, between men and women. You don't, for example, if they, they come and they sit in our living room, they will sit in your living room, men and women. But the, if you're the, a gentleman, you might focus talking to the men. And the ladies can focus on talking to the women and still be friendly and pleasant with the opposite sex, but not, you know, not overbearing. So it's just something to remember. So I think we need to practice, don't you? I need a couple to volunteer, a married couple, to be my guests, to be Muslims. Yes, you're pointing at each other. How many of you vote for this couple right here? Excellent, why don't you come up? You're gonna visit me, you're gonna visit me. Oh, by the way, before you come up, before you come up, two more points. Please have a seat. Two more points. Um, a lot of Muslim cultures don't show the bottom of their foot to someone. They consider that dirty and it's insulting. So they don't sit with their legs crossed, pointed to someone, exactly, just like that. Like you're doing, is that your wife? Yes, you were just insulting your wife. You know, and we know this, we, we had a neighbor lady who became very friendly with me when we were living in Jordan and uh, she was telling her a story one day. She said, you know, she said, I was out on the street and some young men drove by in a car and they said something insulting to me. So I did that. <laughs> and we thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's what, it, you know, it's, it's super insulting. I guess the bottom of your foot is regarded as dirty. Another thing to, to note is that the way to draw a, a, a visit to a close, kind of a polite way to do that, because they'll stay for hours and hours enjoying the talk, so forth, late into the night, talking, and, to, and that's when you talk about Jesus, is over a meal or tea in your house. That's when it happens. That's the power. So that's a really great opportunity. But the way to draw to a nice close is when you sense that the visit is starting to come to an end, you offer coffee. That's a signal that the, that the uh, visit is coming to a close, okay? So those are kind of the rules of hospitality and I wanna do a little demo, all right? I need a chair, is there a chair up here? Uh, I'll use the piano bench, is that all right? All right. Oh.
what are your names? Tim and Becky. Tim and Becky. Great. Well, now you're Mahmoud and Aisha. Which one is which? Anyway, he's Mahmoud, you're Aisha. Okay. All right, there's my door. So you're on the outside of the door. Go ahead. Pretend there's a door right here, okay? And you're going to knock on my door. I'm an American. I'm going to show you some hospitality. What I want you guys to do is if I do something wrong, something that violated the rules I just shared with you, I want you all to go, eh. Let's practice. One, two, three. Okay, excellent. So to see how much you learned. All right, I'm in my house. It's 9 p.m. And this is Mahmoud and Aisha. Thank you for doing this, by the way. Yeah, I know, you're fine. And uh, Aisha's wearing the hijab, and I'm here, and I'm watching TV. I wonder who that is. Oh, hi. Uh, how are you? Oh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting you tonight. Good. Uh, okay, well, well, come on in. Oh, great to see you, Aisha. How are you? Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, have, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry about the mess. It's just such a mess in here. Okay. Um, uh, you know, you can have a seat there. Please, Aisha, please have a seat. Um, if you want something to drink, uh, you, can go to the, you can go to the fridge. Ah, good. Well... <laughs> what, would you guys like some coffee? <laughs> would you give them a hand? Sometimes they'll take their shoes off when they come into your house, you know, and that's fine. So, good. Little demo. So that's hospitality. Be a friend. But Muslims love to hang out. They love to spend time. They love to relax. So include them in your life as much as you can. And as you do, you'll have many opportunities to share Christ. Step three, share the gospel. I'm going to go through this presentation of the gospel line by line. Do you start, and this is the NE3 version, kind of uh, shortened. And we've used this very powerfully in Tampa. I've spent m many hours with Muslims, many hundreds of hours, talking to them about Christ. And this presentation is the first time that I have had Muslims listen with interest, not interrupt me, and understand the atonement at the end of the presentation. So it's very powerful. And one of the reasons for that is that this is in story form. And they come from storytelling cultures. And one of the rules of a storytelling culture is that you don't interrupt them until the end. So let's go through it <clears throat> line by line. First, you will ask your friend, are you going to heaven when you die? You'll be, let's say you're over tea or, or a meal at your house. You say, I'd like to, to ask you a question. I know you believe in heaven and hell. I, and I hope you live a long time. But I'm interested to know, are you, do you believe that you're going to heaven or to hell? The answer will always be the same. They will always say, no man can know. They'll use an Arabic phrase, Allahu alim. Only God can know that. Okay? Next, you say, well, I know that I'm going to heaven, not because I'm a good person, although I try, but because God has made a way for me to know that I'm going to heaven. Then you talk about, you say, I want to tell you a story to explain why. And you have your Muslim friend's interest at this point. Oh, you know you're going to heaven? Why is that? And then you tell them, Jesus was perfect and he did miracles. And they believe that Jesus was perfect and he did miracles. They'll be nodding. But one day, he turned to his friends and he said, I have to die and rise again. Do you know why he said that? Well, this will be mystifying to them because what you're doing is you're actually quoting a verse in the Quran. In the Quran it says that Jesus, when he was a baby, 
miraculously uttered these words, Salamu alayya, yoma walidtu wa yoma amutu wa yoma sa'ub'ithu hayyan. Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I am sent back alive. Well, as we reviewed last time, Muslims don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. So that's a mystifying statement to them in their own Quran. The way Muslims explain it is that Jesus, who is now alive in heaven, will return one day to establish Islam on the earth. He will um, destroy all the churches. He will kill all the pigs. He will establish Islam. He will marry and then he will die. And there's actually a tomb with his name on it in the city of Medina waiting for him. But still, the verse sounds a lot like it's saying that he'll die and rise again. And that's what we believe. So you're saying, do you know why he said that? Well, tell the story of sacrifice in the Bible. And you start with Adam and Eve, and you say, you know, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, before they left, God made them some clothes out of the skin of an animal. And in this way, an animal died in order to pay for sin. And then all of the prophets did the same thing. They all killed animals in order to pay for sin. You then go to John the Baptist and you quote him pointing to Jesus and saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you tell your Muslim friend, the reason he called him a lamb is because a lamb is an animal used in sacrifice. That's why Jesus had said he had to die. He gave himself up to his enemies. His enemies captured him and they put him on a cross and killed him. And in this way, he became the perfect sacrifice that was enough to pay for the sins of the whole world, your sins and my sins. Three days later, God raised him from the dead to show that the sacrifice had been accepted. The Bible says, if you believe in Jesus, if you receive him as Lord and you believe that he died and rose again for you, your sins will be forgiven and you will go to heaven. And that's the presentation. I think we need to practice. So let's split up into twos and one of you uh, explain that to your Muslim friend. One of you is the Muslim and one of you is, and the Muslim's just gonna listen and the Christian practice telling the story to each other. Let's do it one time right now. Excellent. Good job. Yes, sir. I have a question for you. You said earlier that Muslims are, love stories and telling stories and everything else like that. So yes. Why can't they understand the narrative of the Christian? That yeah. That they're all different stories about the same thing. Yes. His question was, if Muslims love stories so much, why aren't they listening to the Christian story? Uh, it's because they don't know it. 
They need to, they need to be told the Christian story. And a, a great thing to do is to go through Bible stories with them. Things like uh, Jesus healing the demoniac uh, uh, or uh, Abraham almost sacrificing his son. Anytime you read Bible stories to them, they are absolutely riveted and they'll have amazing insights into those stories. It's as, if, uh, it's as if those stories were written for them sometimes. It's a wonderful experience to take them through the Bible. Good, so can I have a volunteer come up and tell me the gospel using this format? I have a volunteer over here. Sir, that's amazing, come on up. Do we have a mic for him? Do we have a mic for him, can we? Yeah. What's your name? Alex. Alex, all right, Alex. So I am the Muslim friend, all right, and are you, where do you go to school? Oak Mount High School. Oak Mount High School, so I'm at Oak Mount High School. All right, and my name's Ahmed. And you and I play soccer together. All right, so we just finished soccer. Okay. Uh, tell me your name again, I just forgot it. Alex. Alex, okay. <laughs> okay, so, hi Alex, how are you? I'm doing good. Oh, I'm so glad, you, you're good at soccer. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good game. GG. <laughs> I love that header you put right into the, into the goal. That was amazing. You jumped about four feet in the air. I think it was more of like six. Wow, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> this is fun. Um, I know that you believe in heaven and hell and everything, yep. but I was just wondering if you knew whether you were going to heaven or hell or which one. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, we can't know that, right? How can we know? Only God knows that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I know where I'm, I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Really? Yeah. Well, how, I know how that. How do you know that? I know that because I know Jesus, and Jesus was perfect, and he did miracles, and he became that ultimate sacrifice, and when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, God accepted that as a sacrifice, and to put that with context, I, say, I guess I'd have to take you back to Adam and Eve. Oh. From the very first time that I know sang, Adam and Eve. We have that in our yeah. stories. We know about yeah. Adam and Eve. We love Adam and Eve. Well, anyways, from the very first time that they sinned, you know, God had to cover them with animal skin to cover their sin as a sacrifice. We know that story. Yeah. That's amazing. You have the same story. Yes, I do. Mm. And uh, to quote John the Baptist, he said, look at the Lamb of God. We know John the Baptist. He's one of our prophets. Yeah, we call said, him Yahya. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Really? And do you know why he calls him the Lamb? No. He calls him the Lamb because he became that sacrifice. Oh. Because the Lamb was an animal that they used as a sacrifice. Wow. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he became mm -hmm. the sacrifice. And when he rose from the dead, that was to show that God accepted the sacrifice. And so if you can accept Jesus as Lord and believe that he died and rose again for your sin, he will... Uh, forgive you and you can go to heaven when you die. You can have that assurance. Oh, but don't you believe in three gods? Yeah, I do. No, I believe in one God. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. He did really well. Gracious me, we are ready to go. Hallelujah. Watch out, Muslims of Oakmont High, is it? That's great. Praise God. Thank you, Alex. Excellent. So share the gospel with your Muslim friend. That's one way to do it. And uh, it, at the end of this uh, session, uh, I'll ask if people are willing, if you know a Muslim, to sign up as an ambassador. An ambassador and I'll explain what that is. Anyone who signs up as an ambassador will send them a copy of these PDFs, a, a PDF of these, uh, of these slides, so you can have all of them. And Barry, Pastor Barry actually has the slides also, so if you need a PDF, you can go to Barry as well. Okay. Uh, step four is to share the Bible with them. I think we've covered pray for them, be a friend, um, sh and, and then uh, share the gospel, but share the Bible with them. Uh, Bible is so powerful in the life of Muslims. A lot of Muslims come to Christ because of their exposure to the Bible. And uh, for example, I was leading a, a little Bible study for an ESL program and we had some Muslims in the class. One of them was a professor of biochemistry who was getting some additional study work done at USF. He was from Iran. And I remember going through the Sermon on the Mount and we came across Matthew 
chapter seven, verse 12, where Jesus said, so therefore, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. You're familiar with that. And he stopped the study when we read that, and he said, this is the most important statement in all of religion. It just struck him. He had never heard teaching like that. There's nothing like that in Islam. They, they have the reverse. They have, don't do anything to anybody else that you wouldn't want them to do to you kind of thing. But they don't have, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And it, it wasn't a few sessions later, we presented the gospel in that Bible study and he accepted Christ right in that Bible study. You could tell the Bible had an impact on him. And this is so true of so many Muslims. Another time I was at UT, the University of Tampa, and I found the Muslim student group and went and attended. And they were talking that night about the story of Abraham almost sacrificing his son. Muslims believe that that son was Ishmael. The Bible tells us that the son was Isaac. And they had a, an expert, an imam, in, in the room, a sheikh, explaining the story to everyone. At the end of his explanation, I said, well, that's in the Bible as well. And one of the people there said, well, why don't you read it to us? So I read the Genesis 22, the story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac and how God provided the sacrifice. It's a wonderful story, and it definitely points toward the cross, so it's a great story to share with Muslims. At the end of it, one of the gentlemen in the room said, wow, he said, I've never heard that. We need to read the Bible every time we meet. And uh, I saw the leader of the group kind of look at him like, oh. and, and the next time they had the meeting, they moved it and didn't tell me where it was so that I couldn't go. So I don't know what happened. The Bible has a huge impact on Muslims. And so if God gives you a Muslim friend, pray about ways to bring Bible stories into your conversation or into your interaction. Good. Step five is to invite them to church. And you have an amazing church, I can tell, just because of who you guys are. So this would be a great church to invite your Muslim friends to. Top three factors that the studies show Muslims are coming to Christ through is a friend, the Bible, and visits to a church. So don't be shy. Ask them to come. I think there are several reasons for that. Number one, until your Muslim friend comes to church, they don't know if you're just crazy or if there's actually a community out there that believes like you do. Number two, they are group, not individual oriented, right? And so when they see a group worshiping and agreeing on doctrine and loving each other and having meals together, Chick-fil-A on Wednesday night and so forth, they, are, they, they think May, maybe I could be part of that group. And then when you do bring them to church, make sure that you tell your pastor ahead of time and that if possible, the head pastor personally comes and welcomes them because it's so honoring to them. There was a, an Iranian woman who asked about coming to Idlewild, Barry, that you arranged this. One of the th things that had an impact on her was how you guys as the pastoral staff welcomed her. And Pastor Ken personally went over to her. She later said, I was blown away. Why would the pastor of this big church talk to me? And she ended up getting baptized at Idlewild. And she's, by the way, doing really well. So praise God. Okay, let's recap. Pray, be a friend, share the gospel, share the Bible, and invite them to church. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. That's a great question. Well, <clears throat> the, oh yes, I'll repeat the question. Oh, what's your name, sir? Bill. Bill asked, why didn't you go to 1 John chapter 5 where it says, he who has the son has life, he who does not have the son does not have life. You could just set it right there in front of them like that. Well, that would be fine. I, I'm not eliminating that possibility. But I've noticed something. If you go to Acts chapter 2, and read Peter's sermon to the Jewish people who are there 
from all the nations. Do you know he never says Jesus is God? But he, he basically shows them that he is. But he doesn't hit that tripwire right in that first sermon. I don't think it's wrong to, but I also think it's possible to tell the gospel story in a way that unfolds it before your friend so that they get the hard bits at the right time. For example, in this approach, one of the obstacles to their believing is they don't believe Jesus died on the cross, but you leave that to the end of your story and you've enticed them at the beginning by saying, I know I'm going to heaven and here's why. So they wanna know why you're going to, and then you're touching on all their stories so they're intrigued by it and then at the end, you reveal the death of Christ on the cross. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, I've got a neighbor who is um, maybe somewhat of a partial Christian years ago. Oh. Converting now to Islam. Yeah. Um, one, what's the draw? Two, other than being a friend and, and, and working to nurture that relationship and sharing Christ in a gentle, um, slow fashion, what, what, what would a good strategy be? Okay, is this friend male or female? Male. And how old? Okay, very interesting. One of the things I ask often is, how, how is this person's relationship with their dad? Because I, what's that? Not good. Not good, yeah. So I find a lot of American males are looking for kind of a father, kind of what their father didn't provide them or what they don't feel like their father provided them. An affirmation of them as men, um, a, a, a brotherhood, a place where they're accepted and and honored, Um, a sense of belonging, all that stuff. And so that's all the draw. So just a lot of prayer, I would say. And I would say also, God has put you there. You are playing a role in that man's life. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Just love that guy. I would say, and, and, and have compassion on him as a man who probably has internal pain that he's trying to deal with. Yeah. So be one of the bright spots in his life. And I'd say invite him to this church and let these people love on him. Right? Maybe there's a men's group too who can kind of enfold him and make him feel welcome without kind of yeah. There you go. Yeah. Good. Praise God. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, it's a, they may not know the English word. I would say something like, God knows everything. God can do anything. And I like to ask, I use questions, so I would ask them, well, what is God capable of doing? They say everything. And I say, then he can be a person, you know. Good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right. Actually, the Quran doesn't say who it was. It, and in fact, the Quran kind of implies that it was Isaac. The, old, the Muslim scholars from the early centuries of Islam are divided on whether it was Isaac or Ishmael, but recently, Muslims have said, no, no, it's Ishmael. They don't, like, <laughs> they don't like it being Isaac because of the Jewish uh, thing, with the competition with the Jewish people. But when you read the Bible to that man, and he was whoa, I've never heard that before, and read, you read that he was Isaac. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, in fact, in that, in that account, did it use the word Isaac? I think it did. They were riveted. 
I've gone over time, I'm so sorry. Let's go to the next slide really quickly. How can you be involved? Uh, first of all, uh, please, if you have a Muslim friend, sign up to be an ambassador. There's a physical sign up right here. I will put a QR code on the screen that you can use with your phone. Sign up to be an ambassador. We'll reach out to you once a month. We'll ask for your prayer requests and our special prayer team will pray for all your prayer requests. We'll keep that alive. We'll send you a copy of, of these uh, of these slides as well. That would be fantastic. You can also be involved by joining our special prayer team. If you are a prayer warrior, we would love to have you pray for our ambassadors when they have these requests. You'll get emails, real time, things like, oh, an ambassador is about to visit a Muslim, please pray for them, or oh, you know, this Muslim wants to read the Bible with me and I don't know what to do, please pray for me. Those prayers are just changing lives and uh, it's a great thing to do. It's like battle right from your own living room. Um, and here's the QR code. Great. So please take advantage of that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this time and these wonderful people, this wonderful church. Oh, Lord, uh, I just pray that you would take this hour that we've been together and multiply it. Equip your people and send them. Lord, these Muslims that they know, we pray that every one of them would hear the gospel and see it lift out, that the light would shine brightly in these your people. Bless them. May they be fruitful. May Muslims come to know Jesus. Here in the Birmingham area, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you guys.